Hi, everyone. This is Sima Lieberman, the inclusionist with Everyday Conversations on Race for Everyday People, where we bring people together across race to have conversations about race. If you've ever wanted to have a conversation about race, but were afraid to do so because you were afraid of either saying the wrong thing and being attacked or being ignored or trivialized, then this podcast is for you. Having a podcast, listening to podcasts will never cost you any money. It's always going to be free. But putting together a podcast does cost money. So to that end, we've created a Patreon account. And if you'd like to help support our show and keep us going for as little as $3 a month, please go to www.patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N slash race convo, convo like conversation, and subscribe to our podcast. I'm talking to Kamal Bell, Emmy Award winning political comedian. He's appeared on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, Conan, The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, CBS Mornings, I could go on and on and on, The Breakfast Club and This American Life. He has two stand-up comedy specials, Private School Negro on Netflix, and semi-prominent Negro on Showtime. His writings have been featured in Time, The New York Times, Vanity Fair, The Hollywood Reporter, CNN, Salon, and the LA Review of Books. He's the LA ACLU Artist Ambassador for Racial Justice and serves on the Board of Directors of Donor Choose and the Advisory Board of Hollaback. And along with Kate Chats, he's the co-author of the book, Do the Work, an Anti-Racist Activity Book. Hello. Hey, hi. hi. You know, um, you and I met a long time ago. I was at that. I was at that event that you did at was it um, one of the one of the schools in Berkeley after they kicked you out of the cafe. Oh, the Willard at the yeah. Lieutenant Willard. You and I were one of the few people who said we didn't think that you should have been fired. And then I ran into you on the street on Shattuck Avenue when I was starting my podcast. I said, "Would you be a guest?" And you said, "Yeah." But then you became like real big on CNN. So, <laughs> you no. Know. So okay. So now. Your book, Do the Work, Anti-Racist anti Activity Book. Uh, what made you decide to write the book? You know, it was 2020 when many of us were watching the COVID numbers on the news and the cases go up and many of us who were able to be locked down were locked down. And then at some point on May 25th, George Floyd was murdered by police in Minneapolis and the news said, wait, here's another story we should be paying attention to. And me and my friend Kate, Kate Schatz, who co-wrote the book, who's also from the Bay Area, were like, a lot of people are in the streets going to protest, but what happens after the protest? A lot of those, a lot of anti-racist books went to the top of the New York Times bestseller list, but what happens after you buy those books, after you read those books, if, if you read those books? We wanted, we wanted to create a book that was actually help people engage and understand that anti-racism is a job and it's something you have to be engaged in regularly. You can't just go do it once. You can't just do it once on Twitter, or once on Instagram. You have to be engaged in this regularly. Yeah, what I liked about your book too is that, you know, you use humor in the book, and it's not, I, I'm not an academic. Like I tell people I could have been, but I chose not to be. I like that it's not like a super academic book because some of the anti-racist books are very intellectual and they're for people who are just like already there. You know, they're already like yeah. whatever. I don't know, maybe they're like guilty white people. I don't really know. But I really like that your book is really down on the ground. I mean, and everybody could read it and everybody could understand it. So I have a couple of questions. How, how do you explain, like when white people will go, oh, there's no such thing as white supremacy, I'm not in the Ku Klux Klan. How do you explain that? Well, that first of all, we have to understand it took a long time in America before white people even invented the Ku Klux Klan. So racism already existed before the Ku Klux Klan. And the Ku Klux Klan specifically was a response to reconstruction and black people actually rising in power in the South. They were be, they actually were elected officials. They started to become local community leaders. They started to raise, they started to have more wealth and white racists in the South who were also community leaders said, we have to scare them out of this. We have to make it clear that they're not welcome here. So we have to understand that the Ku Klux Klan was a response to black, the rise of black folks. And what happened is that a lot of white people realize it's not a good look to be in the KKK, even if you wear the hood. So then they figure out, as Malcolm X said, they took off the hoods and put on the suits. Well, some of them did. And then, so you can still be an active racist in this country and not be a Ku Klux Klan member, as we have learned through the recent history of this country. And on top of that, the, the most of the wealth of this country was built on racism. You can look at a lot, many major corporations in this country. When you look back at where that wealth came from, it came through, it came through, it started during the days of slavery, during the days of Jim Crow, and even companies now, 
major multi-billion dollar, even trillion dollar corporations are not paying living wages to the people who put who are doing the work in that company. And that's white supremacy. And a lot of those living wages are being paid to not to being paid to black folks who are black and indigenous and Latino. And so racism is still the law of the land in this country. The reason why, if you look at the prison system, black people are like 12% of the population, but we make up 30% of the prison system in, around the country. And that and that's we're not doing more crime. It's just we're being overcharged for either the same amount of crime that white folks are doing or we are not being we're, we are didn't do the crimes, but we're getting caught up in the justice system. So these are ways in which this country has white supremacy as the rule of the land. Yeah, you know, a lot of people get, uh, you know, a lot of people make the point that they say, well, you know, why are like black people getting killed for, tra you know, at a traffic stop? And I said, well, that doesn't seem to be working because they're still being killed. Why don't we make I mean, I shouldn't say this, but I'm saying it anyway. <laughs> why don't you make the argument then, then start killing white people for the same thing? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I think people have to understand that, like, there is no way to, you know, you see this happen. I mean, we just videos have come out this week that that when black people are conf are pulled over by police, that we actually have legitimate fear of it being a life and death situation, even if it didn't start out that way. You know, so I think or you have to understand that a black person getting pulled over by cops is might is going to be in fear for his life because of what we've seen in the media and the news and that we don't we can't necessarily feel like the police are our friends or that the police are gonna be reasonable. I, I'm, I remember in my show, United States of America, when we were talking about policing in this country at one point, I sh at the beginning of the show, I showed, a no like I showed a video of a white kid in Oregon who fought like nine police officers because he was high on mushrooms and he even pulled one of their guns and shot it into the wall and he lived to tell the tale with just being bruised. Meanwhile, black people just get pulled over by cops and traffic stops and end up dead, even though we don't we are unarmed and don't reach for a cop's gun. So I think the idea being that like until we until we until black people can feel safe, until we can look at cops as our all of cops as our friends when we know we're not doing anything wrong, then the system is broken. Yeah, there was that Twitter thread for a while called Crime and Well White. And it was white people talking and white people talking about the fact that they had done all these horrible things yes. and nothing happened because they were yeah. white. Yes, I mean, it's the idea of like, you know, we have in a book, we have a thing called uh, Check Your Privilege, which is a list of things that we are saying are privileges, not that they are good or bad, but they're just things that if you have them in this country that you are a privileged person. And one of those has gotten away with yelling at a police officer. I, so, I, I love this. I, I love the piece on privilege, too, because yeah. it was like if you're a billionaire. I mean, I really like it because I think that your book can like almost any white person who's who's a thinking white person could relate to it, you know, mm -hmm. and not, and it's not like something like, oh man, you know, this is just so intellectual, blah, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I really like that. And I really think that everybody, every white person who wants to do something should read your book. And I was just reading today that um, Garrett Ziegler, who was one of Trump aides, talked about the fact that the January 6th committee, he said is anti-white. And then he says, and just to let you know, I'm the least racist person in this room. Oh, so, yeah. What do you say to that? I want, I want, what does that look like? So when, when Trump said, I don't have a racist bone on my body. How do you respond to that? Well, you must be boneless then. That's <laughs> what I would say to Trump. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea being that like, that anybody who says I'm the least racist, anything, I don't have a racist, blah, blah, is actually admitting that they are racist. Because the idea being that like, it is not something that is, that is separate from you. It's a system we live in. And if you're a part of the system and you're not actually fighting against racism, then you're participating in racism. So the, so the idea that like nobody, you never, there's no Martin Luther King quote where he said, and I'm the least racist person. <laughs> in, like, <laughs> and he might have been one of the least, whatever racist people is. I mean, I'm making a joke, but the idea being that, like, unless you're actively fighting against racism, then you're participating in it. And if you're a white man in this country, you're, you're generally benefiting from it very clearly. And especially if you're, if you're a position of power like Donald Trump was or the people around him. So you're benefiting from racism and it is not enough to say you're not a racist. You, we need to see you, you need to, you need to do the work and then show your work. Besides which, what does the racist bone look like? What's yeah. the racist bone look like versus a non-racist bro yeah. bone? I don't know. I mean, it's I know a bone like with a white hood on it. <laughs> I know time is moving. I'm afraid that they're going to um, cut us off. So here's a question I have. So the first thing, somebody says, okay, I want to do something. I don't know what to do. I'm going to read this book. And then what would you say is like the first thing that somebody should do? 
Well, you can literally in the book at the about three quarters of the way through, there's a thing called the big list of actions you can take. So if you just want to like skip ahead and not do the work of going through the book, you go to the big list of actions you can take. And it is just filled with ideas and suggestions for things to do in, in your community to figure out how to create less racism. So it's like we're trying to make this as easy as possible. Just turn to the big list of actions you can take in your community and they can be around issues that you're near and dear to your heart. If you go, if you figure out who's feeding the people in your community who don't have food and you go there and volunteer your time or give them money or and you know donate good food, not the food that you don't want to eat in your cupboard, <laughs> if you actually if you actually go there and go, how can I help you? You are participating in creating an anti-racist society. If you say, I'm interested in voting, well, okay, it's not enough to just vote on the day of voting. You can go to organizations go and you can register people to vote. You can organize, you can organize ways to get people to the polls. There's things you can do. If you're interested, I'm a part of an organization called Donors Choose. I'm on the board of directors. You can go to the donorschoose.org website. You can put in your zip code and it will list public schools in your area that need resources and help. You can either donate yourself or share them with people in the community. Every week you could say, this week me and my friends are gonna, our fund, are gonna fund this Donors Choose project to help a, a school in our community. So there's many things you can do and we have suggestions in the book. Yeah, so everybody could do something. You know, one of the things that I, I read about now, they're all worried, like in some of the states, that white kids are gonna be uncomfortable if they talk about racism. So I have a question. What about the black and brown kids who are uncomfortable because of racism? Yeah, what happens we, to yeah. them? What about us who've been uncomfortable yeah. and are uncomfortable every is it, day? Is there we a always, hotline? Is there a hotline to call? There's a hotline for white kids to call. <laughs> no, I think that's the idea is that, I mean, you know, people act like I have three daughters. They have, they know what they know about their overturning of Roe versus Wade. They know they watched the January 6th that's happened on TV. They know about slavery. They know about Kamala Harris being the first black woman vice president. They know about, and also mixed race black vice president. They know about Barack Obama being American. They know about all these things and it doesn't overwhelm them or make them feel sad or scared. It just informs them and better prepares them for the world. We get so caught up in like, but what if the kids know this? What happens then? They'll be smart. I hope the kids do know what I have a son who's 28. I raised him right. Yeah. He was raised, he was raised up right. So I know, I know I gotta let you go as much as I hate <laughs> to do that. Yes, and I, I really want to thank you. I hope I can get you on another time on my show for a, yes. a longer convo. Uh I've been I just want to say I've been following you for a long time before you were even famous. I just want to know. Thank I'm you. one of the first. Okay. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you for doing it. Anyway, that. thank you so much. Everybody should read everybody should read the book. Say the name of the book. The work. The book is "Do the Work," an anti-racist activity book for adults. Um, and where do they buy it? They get it. Get it. Call your local bookstores. Get it from your local bookstore. Get it from Bookshop.org, which supports local bookstores, or get it from that place where we all get stuff from, like books, the yeah. toilet paper. You know what it's called. And start a book club. Start you know a book what? club. Do start it with somebody club. else. And then, because if you hold each other accountable for doing some of these actions, then you'll really do them, and you could share your wins and your successes. That's and then you, yeah. and then you can send a note to to Kamal and Kate and say, "Hey, this is what we did. Aren't you glad we, are, we did we are, it?" People are doing that on Instagram already. All these Instagram stories of people doing the work. We're really proud well, of it. I'm glad. And thanks again. I guess I won't be seeing you in the Berkeley Street. You don't live here anymore, huh? I'm in Oakland, so I'm, I'm occasionally oh, you in the are? Yeah, I'm not, I didn't move out of the Bay Area. I just moved across towns. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then maybe yeah. I'll see you in the street again. Yeah, yeah, yeah All absolutely. right. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye. A partnership in writing this book. Yes. Well, why is it important, as a white person, why, why is it important to you, when I'm asking the question, what, when did you first become aware of race? Mm. So I actually, you know, I don't think everybody has like an aha moment about this again, especially white people, because we're really taught to not see race and not see ourselves as, as, as part of this. Um, but I had an experience that I really remember when I was in ninth grade and I grew up in San Jose, California. Um, and I grew up in um, my neighborhood itself was very white, but um, the com larger community, we had a large Latino population and my school, my public school was about 50% white, 50% Mexican, and that demographic was shifting. And there was a lot of anxiety um, in the white community about, about that. And I have a memory of being asked to speak to a panel of prospective parents for my public high school. And I was like one of the representatives of the school, you know, a shining example. And I had Latino friends of mine that were on this panel with me, my peers. And I remember looking at a sea of white parents and they were all just talking to me. 
And they kept asking me questions about, do I feel safe at the school? Do I have any problems with other students? Are there gang problems? Am I okay? And I had an absolute light bulb moment of realizing, oh my God, they are talking to me because I'm white and they're white. And they see these classmates of mine, my friends, they see them as a threat and they're not talking to them. And I, 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 it was like clear as day, I realized it. And I went home and I wrote a letter to the editor of our local paper, <laughs> calling out the racism of these parents and you know, standing up for my classmates and saying, I, yes, not only do I feel safe at this school, but I feel enhanced and I feel like a better person because I'm exposed to other cultures and languages and people. Um, so that was really kind of my turning point of seeing myself um, um, as white and how I'm seen and seeing race around me. So had you been a social activist before or was this actually that aha moment when you said, you know what, I don't like what's going on. I got to do something. You know, I really was. I was a kid who loved to read the newspaper. I loved current events. I had a really keen sense of justice from an early age. I credit my parents with that. Um, I was a feminist. I was into like animal rights. Um, I was a vegetarian, you know, but I hadn't thought about race yet. So, you know, I, sometimes I say that uh, environmentalism and animal rights was like my gateway to activism. You know, I loved, I wanted to save the trees and the whales when I was 11. Um, but I it was when I was a few years later that I was like, oh, it's not just about the animals and the trees. It's about these people that are right around me. So, do, do, so I assume you had white friends before, right? I, yes. And what, what did your friends say? Did you get any pushback? Uh, you know what? My friends really respected it. And I think that, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't get pushback from them. I mean, again, I grew up in a, you know, a pretty liberal community. Um, but, but I think that my friends appreciated it and I've gotten feedback from them over the years that, you know, that they felt inspired by me. You know, I was often the only one speaking up. I, I was definitely like the loud one and I, I was always trying to get people to do more. Not everybody had the courage to, to join me in that, but um, yeah, I think people appreciated that. And that's again, why it's important for me to still be talking about it, to, to be a model of that. Uh, do I do it perfectly? Absolutely not. <laughs> do I mess up? Sure, I absolutely do, but I keep going. So how about now, what's your life like now? What are your friends now? Are they still mostly white or are they mixed or what's what's the deal? Yeah, that's a great question, you know, and to be honest, um, most of my, you know, my kind of close circle of friends and that I that I live around in the air are white. Um, I have a lot of friends of color for sure, but most of my close friends that I'm interacting with on a regular basis are white. Um, and I mean, I value all of my relationships and um, it's been great having this collaboration with Kamau, but I'm, you know, I don't like to pretend, uh, you know, um, that's uh, my partner, my, my future wife, my fiance, she's white and, uh, we're raising white kids uh, on a on a block uh, that's pretty white, and uh, that's 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 where I'm at. And for, so your kids, I mean, are you, do you bring your kids? Are, are your kids around other people? Oh, absolutely, like white people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, we live. I mean, we live in a, in a in a diverse community. We live in a you know diverse part of the country. They are exposed to. Um, they are definitely exposed to all kinds of kids, all other languages and cultures. Um, and uh, I talk to them about all of this stuff regularly. Oh, that's good. And then when in your house, I mean, you have people in your house that are also not white that come in and out of your house. We do. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a, that's a really important, that kind of exposure, um, you know, who your kids see you being friends with. Yeah. It's really important. And I think that, that I, I'm always curious because I was actually, since I was really young, always around, people who were not white. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm always, and then people have asked me later on, well, you know, how do you meet not white people? And I said, I don't know, what are your interests? You know, I mean, just what are your, what are your interests? If you're only interested in the same things that every other white person is interested in, I guess maybe that's all you're going to be around. So I'm always, I, you know, I'm, I'm always curious. That's why I have my show because I want to know, you know, what's what's going on with people, particularly around race. And I like to have these conversations. Yeah. Now, in your book, and you talk about white supremacy. Mm -hmm. What I really liked about the book too was that you talk about white supremacy, and you talk about other like white type of things. I just call it white type of things, <laughs> um, in a way that I think a lot of white people 
will hear it and listen to because white people tend to listen to other white people. I mean, that's just, that's what the deal is. You know, they listen to other white people. So what, for, what do you tell people when they say, cause I hear this, don't say white supremacy, blah, 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 blah. There's no such thing as white supremacy. Yeah. Right. Cause racism no longer exists. Okay. Thank you. But um, so what do you tell other white people when they start saying, don't say white supremacy? Well, I just keep saying it. Um, you know, we don't have, here's the thing, the moment that we're in right now, uh, I mean, there was a literal insurrection on the US Capitol led by open white supremacists. I mean, these are people who literally call themselves white supremacists. We've now had multiple mass shootings in this country by people who, young white men who, actively call themselves white supremacists and are motivated by white supremacist ideology. This isn't just like an obscure term that we're throwing around um, anymore. It's never been, but it's not right now. There are tragic, multiple, consistent examples that we can point to on the news, on social media, in our communities. Um, white supremacy, Christian nationalism, these things are actual. They are not just in the fringe anymore. They are, there are elected officials in state legislatures across the country uh, running for Congress who are open, who are spouting replacement theory, dangerous white supremacist ideology. This isn't just like a crazy thing we're talking about anymore. This is very real. And uh, people are still going to continue to deny it. And we're going to continue to keep talking about it. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, as a Jewish person, the white Christo fascist totally freaked me out They're you know really i i was raised i'm a lot old i'm a lot older than you and uh like in the like late 60s 70s we used to talk about fascism i'm like no yeah we had no idea yeah. what was, you know we had no idea yeah. so that's why i think that your work is so important Thank now you. question about white supremacy how do you break it down to people because i think that you know, there's a way of breaking it down. Like sometimes, sometimes some white people, not just white people, but just because you're white and I'm white, we talk about this. Um, they say, oh, well, it's white supremacists. Mm -hmm. But for white people to really change, you got to break it down. So how do you break it down to people? No, well, we try to do that in the book, um, you know, and trying to get people to, we try to give a lot of examples. Um, you know, and again, I think to break down white supremacy, it is the idea that whiteness is supreme that it is better that it is the center of everything and that it is the 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 best that everything else is measured against um and i think one way to break it down is to have people think about all of the examples throughout their life of where whiteness is situated that it's what's what we see it's it's the norm it's in the same way that man is the norm <laughs> you know um uh, we talk about the creation of man, that man is just the stand-in for women too. Um, you know, whiteness is, is kind of the center um, and the norm that everything is um, kind of compared to and, uh, and against. So that is, I think, one way to kind of break it down. Um, and again, to, to, to break it down is that it is, again, the notion that white people are somehow inherently better. And if you disagree with that, then great, you disagree with white supremacy. Well, what... Do you ever talk to people about history, about like how this country was actually founded on white supremacist beliefs? Uh, yeah, I do. And that's what the third chapter of this book is all about. You know, we, I mean, we say this country is founded on uh, two particular, uh, you know, mass tragedies, the enslavement of, of black folks uh, and the genocide of the indigenous people who were here. Those are the, the twin terrors of the founding of this country that are that's what we're rooted in. Yeah, I really like that in the book, it talks about what was like, whose land are we on? Mm -hmm. And it talks about indigenous people. I also like that you have actions that people can take. Yeah. So would you just share a couple of those actions? Like say, say I'm a white person. I mean, a lot of times, like I can have a lot of white people who listen to the show who really don't know a lot about race. Absolutely, I'll share those. And then I'm, I do have to go because I've got to get to my next interview. Um, I'm gonna let you go after them, but just, just. Yeah, yeah, so that's, again, this is what, I mean, all these things we're talking about, this is so heavy and intense for people, right? So we wanted to cover all that in the book, but also then what do you do about it? Um, you know, I mean, I think, I think 
there are so many different things we could do. Volunteering in your community, and that may seem like volunteering, you know, volunteering in your schools, volunteering in local libraries, starting a little free library outside of your house and stocking it with banned books. There's one thing. Oh, yeah. Do. Go on Donors Choose, the website, and search. Donors Choose. Donors Choose is a website where teachers across the country can post their needs for their classroom. You can go in Donors Choose and you can search anti racism or you can search LGBTQ, and you can find teachers across the country who are trying to raise $100. $200, $300 to buy diverse books for their students. You can fund a teacher's classroom today and make sure that kids in another state far away from you have access to books that are probably being banned in other states. Those are some things that you can quickly do, you can easily do. You can put up a sign in your window, you can order a t-shirt that says, I will aid and abet abortion from shoutyourabortion.org and you can wear it to the grocery store you can wear it when you travel this summer. Um, we are, yeah, this book is chock full of ideas like that. You know, I, I know you have to go and I would really love to talk to you longer. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that I get you on another time. Would you, would you in the chat, or would you email me and just email me your email information so I could email you and send you the link? Absolutely. I'm going to okay. put it in right there. You know, and, and one thing I'm probably, I may not put this in the recording, but I may, I don't know. Um, since you've been involved in feminism for a really long time, I'm wondering if you had had any read anything by one of my son's late godmothers was a woman named Margaret Sloan Hunter. I don't know if you're familiar with her. No. She was African American and she was one of the founders of the NBFO, the National Black Feminist Organization. Yes, I do know who that is. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's cool. So, because I, I, I think it's really important that we know history. Yeah. Absolutely. And I never considered myself, I was always involved in civil rights. I was not, didn't consider myself a real strong feminist until I met Margaret. And, and she really, you know, opened my eyes to a lot of things that had, they hadn't been open to. Awesome. Anyway. Thank you so much, Sima. Thank you. And I'm going to email you. We'll send you the link. And I would love to um, talk to you again. 